Ladies and gentlemen, good morning, you all. Sir, advance, quantum mechanics. What we did in previous lectures, we have learned some formally, because the tool set to work with the systems of antiparticles or equivalently with fields. And from now on, we go from one example to another to see how one can apply this formalism. What is the matter? What is the manner to get results? What are results? So we will simultaneously learn how to apply this tool set and new concepts which arise, which come in our focus when we apply this formalism. Then we will learn more about the systems of advanced quantum uh, There will be two lectures about solid state systems, condensed matter systems, and today we will read magnetism, which is kind of yet easy example, but by the end of the lecture, we will learn about interesting, important concepts, about uh, really fascinating things which can occur, where we can come starting from very simple assumptions and again apply the formalism of second quantization right just to outline it shortly we uh, start with something that you know non-interacting electron gas remember that we will get a very simple notion of pro wave function. For most systems involving many particles, it's impossible to find wave function exactly, but some simple assumptions work, and that will be an example of it. Right. We got this function and we will uh, try to optimize it with respect to parameter, which is magnetization. Uh, for that, we need to do some calculations. Uh, calculations of the type we got now in Hamburg, which were uh, explained on Monday. Uh, right? So there will be quite some calculations we need to relate kinetic energy potential energy bring them all together and then we got the ground state which can be magnetic or non-magnetic depending on circumstances um interesting thing is the spontaneous symmetry breaking let us let me not tell you at the moment what is this uh we will talk more about this uh, good uh, up to that up to this point we will talk about properties of ground state which is vacuum right vacuum in a magnet then we look at excitations manifestations of fields as the background of this vacuum we will talk about single particle excitations electrons holes electron hole pairs, what would be interesting that we discover a new type of particles, new type of excitations, which are called magnets and which come from uh, come about the symmetry breaking. All right, that was outlined. Let me just 
give you a little bit more motivation and uh, this kind of uh, sketch general picture not necessarily restricted to paramount. When I was a student of the age, uh, people were mostly fascinated by elementary particles. And indeed, there was a good the reason for this fascination. It's really fundamental, fundamental uh, phenomenon, right? Yeah, there are some fields which uh, uh, persist over the in each point of galaxy, defining everything in this universe. Uh, when I tried to do some, whatever you call it, the work, when I tried to formulate a research project in um, the field of uh, elementary particles, they sent me away. Well, there were too many students trying to do such projects, but they gave me a good argument, which I kind of summarized uh, and uh, which I tried to deliver to you, which is a bit emotional, but it worked. Uh, look, if we study elementary particles, again, let us talk about uh, in terms of advanced quantum mechanics, basically, we study physics of vacuum, right? Vacuum, that's ground state, there are fields in this matter. Vacuum that is potential to create excitations, elementary excitations. All right. I said this. Let's turn to condensed matter solid state physics. Then each material is its own universe, it has its own. Individual vacuum, its properties, its fields, its excitations. So that when we turn to uh, elementary particles, basically we have only a single object to study. When we turn to condensed matter, you've got millions of universes to explore. Okay, I. Uh, didn't have choice. Uh, I turned to condensed matter, and basically I did everything in condensed matter. Um, that was the argument that was that was uh, understanding. So basically, we assess universe and solid state with the same set of questions: What is the vacuum? What are properties? What are the stations on the background of this vacuum? Right. Uh, then you got answers, you wonder what are, if they are interesting or not. Some of them are trivial, most materials are uh, trivial. What, what is usually interesting, what is manifestation of something unusual to know, is that the vacuum has properties which, is, which are normally absent. And uh, frequently, these anomalous and usual properties are related to symmetry breaking. Right? Broad symmetries provide us uh, a source of fascination as well as application, whatever you call this. Right. Uh, so, again, the goal is not to depend in into physics of solid state, magnetism, whatever. The goal is to illustrate the method of the simplest, easiest examples and the uh, simplest models, which we can read easily. Fine. All right. Let us start with this. Let us start with this model. Or oh, are there any questions about this philosophical part? All right. Good. 
don't fall asleep as you did a couple of years ago when you looked at these transparencies. I will chat about non interacting any gas. It is a common model for a metal. Some conducting uh, material. Good, so what do we uh, usually do? I guess uh, what you have been taught in the course of solid physics is uh, very similar to what I'm, I'm, I will say now. The only point I will use operators, but perhaps to some extent they also told you in solid state about these operators. Fine, so with, what do we have? in metals. First of all, single particle levels. The plane waves labeled with K, they always they also have spin and that will be crucial for us because magnetism is uh, spin. Right. Each level has energy. Okay, let's for simplicity assume Parabolic law, you know that in solids it's different, it's a band structure, block waves, and dispersion of electrons might be very different. But let us take it parabolic. Right. So, what is this non interacting FEMI? Yes, it is a state of these electronic systems. Well, levels are filled up to certain energy. Let us understand the contain. Let us understand that this state is a ground state for a given number of particles. How can I prove this? Well, if I do something with this state, for instance, if I take this electron and put it here, I would not kill him. Uh, I, 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 I cannot change the number of particles. I can only put it to another place, right? This is that I have to rise energy. So any change of uh, electron feeling will uh, give bigger energy. So it's in, it's a ground state. Uh, fine. Uh, let us see how to make it in operators. In order to do this, you start with the real vacuum, physical vacuum, no particles, and feel all the levels. Right, sir. So I apply plenty of creation operators. That arrow actually belongs to a uh, K. Sorry for that. I'll just shift it in PDF. Right, so creation for all K's which are within hemisphere, which has K below KF. Why? Because in this, uh, the, the energy corresponding to the states is smaller than semi energy. All right. That's what we um, have. Next step. This is also something which you did, I hope, in solid state course. Let me show the transparencies and let us vote if you did so. Uh, let me concentrate, for instance, on this relation. It's, uh, it's beginning, it's end. Who remembers something of the kind? That's strange. 
you guys who remember are on the, on the left. Uh, let's uh, switch the places next half of the lecture. Um, fine, let me do it. It's ne it never hurts to refresh it. What we want to say, what we want to compute, it's a number of particles in a big system and uh, energy of the system of particles. What did I do? Well, I also take into account that there are two spins direct two spin directions, so I have a factor of two s. I want to keep it right, and I have to sum up overall discrete momenta. I have to make big sums. Right. I don't know whether you learn it in solid state physics. But it's very crucial formula, and we lose it many times in the course. It's got to get from summation of a discrete momentum to integration in the limit of large volume. Look what happens. I have integral over k instead of summation of the discrete case. I have a factor in front. It is the volume, in principle, infinite volume of complex. Good. And I have integral, and uh, there are funny factors of 2 pi to the power of dimension, which are in the denominator. Good. We will apply this formula for quite some time for electrons, for photons, for many things. Good. What can I do with this? First of all, I understand that if I substitute the summation, I have a factor of volume. That's logical because number of particles and energy are also proportional to the volume. Let's uh, think of uh, properties which do not depend on volume. Let me concentrate on density and energy density. Good, then volume cancels. I have these integrals to make. Right, what do I do? I go to spherical coordinates. So instead of uh, integrating over three dimensional k, I integrate over kind of uh, radius in k space. Mm -hmm. I integrate over radius from zero to kf over all field states. That's what I get. Some funny factors which are impossible to memorize, but proportional to U of KF. Fine. Then I do the same for energy density. What is the difference? Well, I have to take each state with a weight, which is energy. Energy is proportional to K squared. That's why the answer is proportional. Oh, I did not, did not write it down explicitly. Okay, control question. Which power of KF the answer is proportional to? Uh, yes, fifth power. We will do this. But well, I hope it was just refreshing of uh, all good solid stat. Right. Now I'm going to make very important, but very simple assumption. So it is trivial, but it's not trivial in the sense that you have rich consequences and actually enable us to do something, right? I kind of heard that magnetism in metals is excess of steam. So electrons have magnetic moments and they try to align these magnetic moments. That's why uh, in magnetic, uh, in a magnet, 
There are more electrons with spin say up than electrons with spin down. Right, how can I describe this situation? Uh, what comes to my mind immediately is a state like this. It's easier to sketch the picture than to write the formula. So let us look at the, at the picture first. I want to put number of particles with different spin to the ground states for each spin separately. Well, since I have less particles with spin down, the corresponding KF, the corresponding energy will be lower than for spin up. So I will have two different Fermi energies or uh, two different KFs. So now I can write it in formulas. This state, which has index P, is obtained by creating all spin downs in corresponding sphere KF down and all spin ups in this sphere. It's a little bit different. I created more spin ups than spin downs. Good. So, what is the status? What is the status of what we did? Uh, it is a wave function. It is not an exact wave function. This would be too complex for us and for any bodies. It is a room wave function, or the same is to say trial wave function. This trial wave function has a parameter. What is a parameter? The parameter eventually is the difference between number of particles we spin up and spin down which we can call polarization. So there is a continuous set of these functions. All right. And I want to choose the better run. How do I do this? The idea is simple. I'm looking, at least at the moment, for the ground state. Ground state has lowest energy. That's why if I use this trial function, I need to find a minimum of energy with respect to this parameter, with respect to polarization. Right? So that sets concrete task. We have to calculate the energy and then we will see if it's energetically favorable to create finite polarization or because it better be non-magnetic. Right, okay, so we have to calculation. Let's do this. First of all, let's compute something which we already have. Let's compute uh, kinetic energy corresponding to this wave function. All right. Such so kinetic energy is uh, just repetition of the calculation we had two transparencies ago. But we need to make it separately for two spins. Fine. So we have numbers of particles 
and those are proportional to kf to the cube for each spin and uh, the total energy and here i promised that we will use this energy density is proportional to the fifth power of each kf fine that's the answer for kinetic energy of our probe states probe state let me rewrite it a little bit to make the polarization explicit that's how i rewrite it so why it is five divided by three you can explain that Yes, because you write KF as positive of N. Mm -hmm. That's why you have uh, five thirds of the polarization. Uh, right. So KF is one third of polarization, one minus polarization. And you get energy, I rise it to the power of five. Just to make it shorter. Very good. I, I, I just played it large, what I have. That's this red line. Uh, polarization goes from uh, minus one to plus one, which means that uh, spins either all uh, down or up. Well, what I see, I see that polarization costs energy. If I look on the economic energy, it is energetically favorable to have equal numbers of, numbers of speeds, energetically favorable to have non-magnetic state. Right, good. If I am trying to build up a model which explains magnetism in metals, I understand that I cannot do it with not interacting with any gas. I have to think about something more complex. This complex is something which is also intrinsic. This is interaction. Before writing concrete terms, let me talk a little bit about this interaction. Let me talk about uh, what you can do um, this interaction in matters. What would be a good model for that? To remind, uh, I just uh, cite that particles in vacuum they interact according to Ohm's law. Okay, I wrote a formula which is actually illegal. Um, you can remind me how can I make it legal? Uh, yes, that's right. Sir, it is uh, liquid magnetic to use systemic induction nine in all physics courses, which I really hate. Uh, this formula is much simpler, but in order to comply with them, um, or I would have to write proportionality coefficient, uh, which, if I'm not mistaken, is such. Anyway, it's proportional to one over R, that's what uh, Monsieur Coulon told us at some point. Now I will do something which perhaps does not uh, speak well, but I, 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 I do presume that you all know about Fourier transform. I want to make Fourier transform, so many Frenchmen say, uh, 
Fourier transform of this potential. So instead of uh, coordinate dependence, I would like to write wave vector dependence. Then whatever, I wouldn't do this integral, but the answer is this. It diverges at small wave vectors. Why is it, sir? Because the potential is long range. One over R is extremely long range potential. Electrons heal each other at long distances. Good, that was lengthy. How about metal? In metals, the situation is different. Uh, I know that many people don't like my drawings, but I do. Um, so I will try to make it as accurately as possible. Let us consider two electrons. In vacuum. If I put it into metal, I have plenty of electrons between them. What do they do? They screen the charge of the charge. That's like, like uh, yeah, you come to, to your friend to a party and it's too crowded. So you, you cannot talk to you, you cannot interact with your friend. You're screened. That's what happens in metals. Very good. What are the consequences? We should try to understand that. The screening exponentially suppresses the potential at distances which exceed some radius. This radius eventually is even smaller than the distance between electrons in the metal. So the interaction uh, falls off very quickly. I'm still trying to use simultaneously coordinate representation and momentum representation. And that's how screening effect looks like here. What's the difference? You don't have divergence at small u at the denominator. You've got a constant which cuts this divergence. Sir, uh, interaction in um, uh, interaction in um, for this space is finite. Then I've got very kind of brave idea, very fortunate for you guys. Namely, I just say, well, uh, why don't I just take it as a constant? Why I why don't I disregard this cube. All right, what happens if in Fourier domain it doesn't depend on Q? It means that in coordinate representation, our interaction is just delta function. Remember, inverse Fourier transform of constant gives you delta function. All right, so it's what we call contact, contact interaction. Uh, the electrons in our model will interact only if they occur in the same point. Fine, we formulate the model of interaction. Let us now get to the lecture. Well, previous lecture, and we call how interaction looks like in uh, in um, second quantization from Remember, it involves four creation annihilation operators, right? 
that I have a diagram and next transparency now. Let me sketch diagram quickly uh, now. So there are two, how to sort it out. It's always good to write to, to, to draw pictures. So there are two electrons, uh, two which, um, Other incoming electrons interaction and two outgoing particles. Right? Q is a momentum or wave vector which has been transferred between particles in course of their scattering, in course of their interaction. There are particles with momenta k and k prime, and k prime gets minus q, k gets plus q. There's a momentum conservation, there's a balance of momentum. Uh, here, these particles can have different spin, which is sigma, sigma prime in our notation. Uh, interaction conserves spin. Outgoing particles also have the same sigma and sigma prime. All right, that's what I want to say about this. Now we understand what to do. We've got to compute this for spin polarized state just by using first order perturbation theory. The same type of calculation. Good. Um, I have started these tools on Monday. Let me repeat those. Um, come on, this is such a problem. This one should not end. You can do this because it will take some time and uh, accuracy, some bookkeeping skills, but you can certainly do this. Right? One needs to reduce num a number of operators involved in these expressions. One can do this by commuting operators. And perhaps, yeah, I put it in a little different order. And one should try to do everything in order not to compute errors. One has to figure out from the very beginning and which terms in the expression in hand do not give you zero for one reason or another. And don't waste time on computing zeros. Good. Uh, right. So I have to sum up all these tools. I don't do it now. I just took one of uh, these terms. So I have four operators. And generally, they have four different indices k1, k2, k3, k4. Right. Then I uh, start in some state, which is number state, and I end up in the same state. What does it mean? It means that electrons which I annihilate should be recreated again. So there are two possibilities to do this. I see that I uh, annihilate and K3 and K4. Good. So there are two possibilities to uh, match these annihilations. I would create in K1 and K2 one possibility, or another possibility I create in different points, which I draw with arrows of two different color, 
new errors and correct errors. Very good. Now I can, 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 can compute it. Remember, on Monday I did it for bosons. Now I do it for fermions. Uh, there, are, there must be difference because fermions anti-commute uh, rather than commute. So let us see what I do. Um, First of all, I made a choice. And which choice I made? Red or blue? Red. Fine. So uh, I now I have only two case, KN, K1 and K2. It's already easier. Now I would like to have it in correct order, like this. In order to get from here to here, I would have to commute. All right, I, I assume here that K1 is not K2. Right, so the matter is anti-commute. I have change of sign. Good, uh, that's the answer. Remember, that can be replaced just by a number when it acts on the number state. That's the answer. Fine, now I do the same for blue thing. And now, in order to get this apparatus in the right order, I have to exchange them twice. That's why I have last sign instead of minus. So that's the blue answer. Other calculation is simple. Uh, it's kind of fundamental in theory of uh, interaction and metals. And uh, it is so fundamental that these two terms are even named differently. That blue possibility is called happy energy. Happy is a present. Fine. Uh, how can I draw it using these diagrams? When I draw these arrows, I kind of couple electron states. And I do here the same just by uh, connecting, uh, connecting um, arrows in this diagram. So it connected like this, like this. Here they are. Fine. That's a drawing. It's interesting to note that already for uh, from this drawing, understand that interaction here comes at zero Q. It's because of momentum conservation. Since uh, the line is the same, momentum here and momentum here, they are the same, right? So the answer depends only on zero, um, at, on, on u and zero u. Okay, now I understand how careful I was. Suppose I can take screening into account. In this case, we would have tremendous problem, right? In this case, we understand that this expression diverged from the very beginning. So one has to take screening first. 
right? So, what's a concrete expression? This is the answer <coughs> I got from previous calculation. Yeah, here it is. Substituted here, and I have to sum up overall Qs and sigmas. And here it's a bit, I, I don't have how to all this activity is still. It's like when you go to, to, uh, uh, to the vacation on camping, you have nothing to do, and there are stupid books when you have find, to find seven differences between two pictures. Uh, just something like this going on. I guess to look at this expression and understand how to proceed. Suppose you are in France and camping, relax. The crucial thing is to understand that this is uh, not a double sum but rather a squared of this expression, right? Indices separate here. So what stands here is eventually squared of this sum and this sum, we know what does this, it's just full number of particles. All right. Just to recognize. Very good. With this, we are done with this energy, this healthy energy. It appears that it doesn't depend on polarization at all. It depends on the on full number of particles. And here it is. I will write it in terms of uh, full number of particles, and it is, uh, I would have to divide by volume. Or if I express it in terms of particle density, then it is proportional to the volume. So again, the introduction gives us density squared. That's what one can figure out uh, in advance. Pretty good. Let's have a break. Let's have a break. Ladies and gentlemen. I am back. So happy energy. It's a bit disappointing, right? Because uh, happy energy doesn't depend on polarization. So we cannot actually decide whether it's magnet or not. Good. So let's look at uh, different possibility different possibility to couple the states red line so now we couple differently and on this diagram we connect the lines differently look you can see the difference now all two electron lines are there in the same loop now they can have different Use and interaction, eventually all three components of interaction are there. But it's important to figure out that they now have the same sigma. So this energy is the sum of two distinct conditions corresponding to distant spins. Fine. 
Let's look at the formulas. That's for general interaction. And for general interaction, we could have a difficulty to simplify this expression further. Okay, fortunately, we have a very simple model of contact interaction. So what do we have here? It's again, same trick. What you find here is eventually a product, is this double sum is eventually a product of two sums is separate in this case. Yeah. Look at it for a second. It's the only point that now they uh, uh, both uh, ends belong to the same spin, right? That's how I we come up we come we come to this expression expression for hot energy. It looks very similar. It is n squared of particle number it's proportional to u interaction constant but it's a sum of two terms number of particles with different spin directions now if we express it in polarization that's what we get And this is negative. So if interaction and so it's uh, difficult to, to follow uh, science, uh, repulsive interaction, it comes with minus, right? Repulsive, uh, they want to get, to get further away, it's minus. Right? That's why this term is negative for repulsive interaction. If interaction between electrons were attractive, it would have been different side. But now, right, it is negative. So hot energy eventually favors polarization. Good, so what do I have to do now? Just to combine all these terms, just to combine kinetic energy, well, hearty energy, but it doesn't depend on uh, polarization, and uh, work energy. Work is the same work which, uh, which uh, figured out how the space they become particles in space. Good, so let me combine what we have. It's a kinetic energy. And this is potential energy, heart energy. And the result eventually depends on the ratio between this constants which determines uh, the strength of interaction if interaction is low uh, potential kinetic energy is more important and uh, the favorable state is non-magnetic state right and uh, if interaction is uh, big enough then it's an ejaculatory favorable to have polarization. So the total energy which is there in the plot does it correspond to polarized or unpolarized state? Plot, total, same blue line. The way. As you see, 
minimum corresponds to final colorization, eventually to medias colorization uh, possible. It could be plus one or minus one, doesn't matter, because there's nothing which actually defines your direction, preferable direction of speed. So it's not magnetic field. The magnet just polarizes by itself. Right? Good. Uh, that is what happens at sufficiently big interaction constants. I have here numbers in the plot. In between, the state is magnetic, but polarization is not ideal. We still have uh, mass speeds. Good, that solves the problem. Of course, it's very approximate model of that. For instance, it explains that there are metals which are non-magnetic and metals which are magnetic. The difference between them becomes different strengths of remaining screening, screened uh, interaction. More interaction, more chance to, for it to become like this. Um, crucial thing is that this double sum, double summation is over two momenta, can be presented as a product of two sums. Is that clear? Now we have to sum up each sum. Here it is simple. Here one would just have to shift the origin. It doesn't matter. Instead of summation of q, one can sum up over k plus q, right? So shift the origin of q by minus k. All right. Are there any questions about this part? It's kind of, uh, you cannot solve this equation precisely, but you can always plot it, whatever, in a plotting program, and you'll see where is the minimum. And that gives you the fact that the, the state, ground state, is polarized. Or not. No questions? Then we're going to break symmetry. Sure, wonder if I can find it. Okay, I will be looking for a tool and talk simultaneously. All uh, right, so it is uh, important to understand that at the moment, nothing tells us which things are up and which us which things are down. They are up and down with respect to quantization axis. And this quantization axis can be set up arbitrarily. Uh, right, so what we have then is that spins are polarized. So they, they choose the wrong quantization axis. So a spin symmetric state, but if it's a magnet, we have certain direction of polarization. The energy of the magnet, at least in approximation which we made, 
does not depend on this direction. Oh, let us see. I could not believe that there is no such symbol to this audience. But okay, it's also technical development. I have to make a less uh, impressive demonstration. Good. There's a system. And it has symmetry. It has symmetry with respect to rotation. Now, what I gonna do is to change conditions. So, there is still symmetry. Yeah, it is symmetric. It is not. It's fallen to a certain direction. This is precisely what is this effect in more general terms. For a symmetric potential, the position of, of minima does have to be symmetric. Frequently, they break. Okay, I like Turk as an example, but my really favorite example is a wine bottle. I wonder if you ever get to the bottom of the bottle. If you do, you can see very interesting potential relief at the bottom. As you remember, if you could, could uh, perceive that the bottle was cylindrically symmetric, huh? so that this potential is cylindrically symmetric. But the minimum is not at the axis. The minimum is here. Let me sketch it. The minimum is on this line. And potential energy, for instance, for a small piece which you put into the bottle, is precisely the same along this line. Fine, this is symmetry breaking in simple terms. That's what we have. We have to restate and uh, continuous symmetry, continuous degeneracy with respect to direction of this quantization. Uh, that was uh, pretty easy to explain. Then I would like to sell you more interesting quantum sta statement. It is called Goldstone Room. There was also a person who formulated it. Uh, the room is like this. If there is a symmetry breaking of this time. In the ground state, there are all these excitations, the small energy, low light excitations, which present this symmetry breaking. Fine, what would be for one bottle if you put a small ball in the one bottle? It could easily rotate without changing energy. If you quantize this rotation, you would get some states with low energy. For instance, like this. Fine. That gives us motivation for next part of this um, lecture. For final part, we're going to look at excitations. We start with the simple excitations, electrons, which are already there, can be excited. And we will finish with magnets, which are these goldstone particles. Good. Excitations. That we have also from your solid state book for 
this is not uh, good so if it is not please don't be shocked excitations in a metal are not only electrons they are also holes is a charge opposite to the electrons. Okay, how can I account for that? How, how can I draw this? This is initial parabolic spectrum of the electrons. Now I have everything filled up to this, sir. If I would remove the electron from here, I have I have a hole. I have a hole, and that costs energy. So if I do something with electrons within hemisphere, I got hole excitations. Is that? So just revert it, low part of the spectrum. Good. <laughs> so already in, in normal metal, we got different excitations, not like in vacuum. We have electrons and holes. And uh, look here, right? If you are very close to Fermi wave vector, it costs almost no energy, vanishing energy to create electron hole pair. That's the property of electrons, uh, of metals. It means that it is easy to get electrons from one place to another place. This means good conduction. Fine, all uh, right. Some notations or uh, what we do to create an electron. Well, it sounds almost uh, uh, idiotically trivial, but oh, we, we just create an electron. We take our vacuum, our ground state, which we have computed, we apply a creation operator. We got single electron state. For a hole, what do we have to do? We have to apply to annihilate an electron. We have to annihilate, that's why if you annihilate at k and sigma, we create a hole with minus k minus c. Logical. All these excitations have positive energy, sir. I do the same, but for magnetic state, for magnetic metal. All right. So the picture gets a bit more complicated. What do I have to do here? I still have two parabolas. Two parabolas corresponding to electronic energies. I got it shifted. Why? Because they have to take different values of Kf. For the metal, they get the same point. Now I have two. At KF down, KF up. Good. Um, consequently, if I now um, define electrons and holes, uh, I have two, two, two different branches for different spins. So, See how many electron branches I have, two electron branches for spin down, spin up. The energies are different. The energies are different. It means that electronic energy does depend on spin. It's the same for holes. See, electrons and holes uh, match for opposite spin because Hole is the absence. Hole with spin up is the absence of electron with spin down. All right. Do we understand the picture?
kind of from a regional picture painted by shifting energies uh, differently for two different things. What is this energy shift? Oh, one does have to wonder, if one would just compute it. Right? Just compute it. You have kinetic energy, potential energy, and what one has to read is the difference between ground state energy and energy is yet another electron. Since we know how to evaluate kinetic energy and potential energy for any number of particles, the interpretation is simple. I don't give the details, but please don't uh, have the impression that it's something complicated, it's something which you can do on the back of the about doing right so what as a result is a shift 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 where do i have this shift uh yeah i guess it's it's here this um shift proportional to the uh, difference of uh, electric concentrations is been up. Single particle excitations. What else you can find over there? We can talk about pairs. It's pretty extensive uh, way of thinking, right? About single particle uh, excitations, two particle excitations, three particle excitations. I could go to the end of my class. Um, we will stop at you. We want to understand uh, something which should uh, rather be useful for magnets. Can create electron uh, hole pairs with different speeds. Um, how would I describe this state? It has two speed components. And it has two momenta. And I choose this two momenta in such a way that Q is a total momentum of these two particles. And the K is a different soft momenta. If I write down energies, It is a difference between electron and uh, all energy, and I end up with this. Right. If I would like to plot the spectrum of the six equations, it depends on two momenta. If it, it, it would depend on a single momentum, I could draw a line. Now, I would have to draw many, many lines. Yeah, now I have a plot for Q, so I would have to draw many, many lines with different case. And these lines will cover the area which I put into green. That kind of plot. Fine, let's, let's look at this plot. These two look like for metal, more or less. There are electron hole pairs, which I say at very small energy, small K. Um, here, interesting case. There is a gap in the spectrum. If electron hole spins are opposite, I would have to pay finite energy to create it at small Q. 
just a peculiarity, but we do use it. Why the two? Because they, it's a, it's a, this uh, energy shift which comes about. This energy shift. Polarization, which creates kind of internal magnetic field. Good. That was yes. What is the actual feedback? Oh, Jesus. Um, I thought you know. You can answer the question. Who who knows what theta is? Holy God. <laughs> this is heavy side function. It's heavy side function, which is uh, to remind is uh, a one at positive argument and zero at negative uh, uh, argument. And this particular uh, inside function gives us states which can be created, which means that it's a size of all uh, k with respect to kf. Good. But is it serious if you see set and you don't see the side function? Yeah? But something like you have only one argument in the heavy side is the function, and there you have like four. Okay, that, 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 was, that was the confusion. Okay. Fine. Um, good. Did I define it? Uh, Electron hole pairs. So we talk about uh, electron hole pairs. Right. And uh, it's time to get. So something which is hidden at the moment. Look, in the way uh, I go, I go from single particles to particles, three particles, which is boring work. And um, uh, as always when you do boring work, it looks like it's a whole life is boring. Uh, it is not so. There's something fascinating in this line. And I would like to create different excitations. I do it in a little bit fancy way, but please understand my main motivation. I would like to use the fact that I could rotate all spins with the same angle and produce a state with same energy. Different state, but with the same energy. Right. Now, if this rotation angle is the same for all electrons in the sample, okay, it will be still state with the same energy. Now, if this angle varies a little bit, from one point to another point, we might say. If I do this, I got a state with a bit different energy, but very small one, as far as the rotation angle is close to constant. That's my motivation. That's what I want to do. Now let me do it technically. 
First of all, I take a book with a cat, go through and find the expression for gravitation operator in spin space. What kind of operator actually rotates all spins by angle I alpha? Here it is. It's unitary operator. So it is an exponent. Here is the angle. And here is separator of spin itself. Right? I rotate around x axis, so I have only sigma x. Fine. What do I know if I have um, um, non symmetric uh, spin bro symmetry broken state? I will have another state with the same energy. Yes, please. It is total operator of total spin of all particles. So whatever, if you think of separate particles, it's a sum of individual sigma axis for all particles, one, two, three, two. Total spin. So like U sum or direct sum of spin as well. Just the sum? Just sum. Just sum. Yeah. Independent particles, they contribute to independent to the spin. But we will. Uh, we are in second quantization formalism. So, in a second, we will rewrite this operator in second quantization formalism. That we're going to do. But first, I'd like to implement the trick. I don't want alpha to be precisely constant. I'd like it to vary slowly. So I made this angle, which depends on uh, to be to be coordinate dependent. And as such, I have integral and spin density. Instead of full spin, I have spin density at a given point. All right. Now I uh, want to expand this exponent. If I keep the ligand term one, it just gives me the same state that I don't want. I would like to get something new. I want to concentrate on first order corrections first order term in the expansion. Here I have this first order term. Look, I've just taken it from here. And now I did what you want to take. I expressed explicitly a curator of spin density. I did it in coordinate representation using field operators of electrons. And now you can see sigma x. You can see sigma x. Spin up is coupled with sigma down. Sigma down this spin uh, this up right and uh, sigma x as we remember is precisely this structure okay do you see sigma x now fine right so now we can figure out what is this. Uh, I will uh, make uh, alpha varying 
as a plane wave with a very small cube. And uh, that, 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 that gives me a possibility to rewrite it in terms of the sum over a single Q or single K at a given U. What does that mean? I concentrate on excitation, which has wave vector Q. This is wave function of this excitation. Anomalize the state. See what I got. I've created something new, some new particle, it's wave vector Q. And uh, the creation operator is composed from plenty of terms. What does each term in this sum do? It creates electron hole pair. Yeah, something that we with recently created. Uh, provided it doesn't give zero when acting on the state, which is uh, which is accounted by this heavy side function. Right? But it does not create a single electron hole pair in a given state. Rather, it creates equal weight superposition of many electron hole pairs simultaneously. That's how magnet is created. Good. Having this expression in hand, we can already do something else. Investigate the problem. Next step, rather trivial, is to figure out whether it's a boson or a sperm. Who knows? Right. How to do this? We have to check commutation relations. So we just trip this into ray trap. And uh, compute commutation relations of this operator. That's what we got. It does not quite match. It looks, but our method is also approximate. Our wave function is also approximate. So, uh, given that, it looks reasonable to replace these operators. C, C, Dega is our expectation values in our ground state. If you do so, we reproduce bosonic. commutation relations. You have made a new particle. Okay. And it arises from this wine bottle uh, peculiarity, from the fact that we can rotate our ground state. Fine. We can also compute energy of this magnum. It's again a little bit uh, <coughs> peculiar work, but we have all elements that does this work. We need to uh, 
right wave function of uh, Mena uh, coupled with this um, creation apparatus of, of, um, of um, electron hole uh, uh, pairs. So we look for a wave function of a single ma magna, and this is superposition of electron hole pairs. Right? Now we want to use it, in fact, as a, uh, as a trial function for our, our Hamiltonian, right? So we need to compute this matrix elements. The computers, there are diagonal matrix elements, which are just energies of electrons and holes, that's fine. But there are also sums over all gas. So if I compute these matrix elements, I've got the following equation Schrodinger like equation for function psi. Uh, what do I do? Okay, as I said, it's a diagonal element. It is uh, just uh, kinetic energies of uh, particles, electron and hole. And this is what comes from interaction. That equation looks difficult but it's possible to solve because well it's just summation over here so the result eventually does not depend on on uh, k it's summed up right one can therefore write equation which gives you energy of the magnet as a function. Okay, that involves integration. Generally, it's, uh, it is uh, rather cumbersome. So, let me show you the result of evaluation of this integral. Here it is. First of all, it is a picture which you have already showed to you. It is a picture of um, uh, electron hole uh, per spectrum. Magnet consists of electron hole with opposite spins. Uh, right, and here we have the continuum of electron hole per spectrum. As I mentioned, there is a gap in the spectrum at small values of Q. Magnum excitation, magnum excitations is a curve in this forbidden gap. At small Q, energy goes to zero, as we expected from this gold, goldstone element. If Q is precisely zero, it is a rotation of all spins at the same angle. It costs precisely zero energy. Q goes high, energy of magnet gets high. Uh, and the uh, harmonic approximation of it is eventually is not that bad. But at some stage, this curve, this magnum curve, has to merge with continuum, so it has to wiggle a bit. Fine. All right. So with this, we can quantify magnet. Okay, now that I... Also, it, 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 it is a nice idea. Uh, what I wanted to say is that I wouldn't give you this uh, calculation as an exam problem, uh, but now I'm not sure anymore. <laughs> uh, 
what I wanted to, 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 to say is that this calculation of magnetic energy is something which you could do yourself with your hands. Uh, uh, eventually, during the exam. In general, I think this course is given at this university, I guess, for. Almost 40 years. Uh, I'm a bit uh, young to do it for 40 years. So there was, uh, uh, this was given by, by a former professor with a uh, little bit strange family name, Dr. Day. Perhaps you, you might have heard about him. Uh, he wrote a book about quarks. And uh, eventually the lecture which I gave to you was one of the exam problems of Professor uh, To be precise, not the whole lecture, but up to transparency number 10. The answer was, the answer which students are supposed to get is that ground state energy. Of course, there were some hints, but well, that was examination problem, say, in uh, 1980. Good. Uh, this motivating message. <laughs> I would like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>